Okay, thank you very much for coming to, uh, this is a British Ecological Society Agroecology sponsored workshop. Um, there are four of us, we're just about to introduce ourselves. We're going to start with a couple of, uh, with a little introduction, a couple of practitioner presentations, and then get on into a kind of hands on workshop. So, my name is Naomi van der Velden, I work both at the Permaculture Association in Britain and also at the University of Cumbria. My background is in plant ecology and I'm particularly interested in um, plant ecosystems uh, and plant communities around food growing, so human and plant communities around food growing. Which workshop is this? Evidence. <laughs> 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 yeah, okay, good. <laughs> You're here anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Too late to go to another one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just let you know where I am. <laughs> yeah, uh, Les Furbank, I'm um, also an agroecologist, but importantly for this, I'm not specific to permaculture. I've worked on GM crops, I've worked on organic farming systems, set aside, uh, and in the last couple of weeks, I've been talking to big landowners and big tractor companies, you name it. And my interest here is the metrics of success of sustainable agriculture. And they should work across all the systems, but they might not necessarily be interpreted in the same way, and they might not, and they might have different flavours. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Barbara Smith, and um, I work currently at the Centre for Agroecology, Water and Resilience at Coventry University. But I'm here today because um, I'm chair of the Agroecology Group, Agriculture Ecology Group of the British Ecological Society. And where do you like to be supporting this workshop? I'm, my name's uh, Pete Ionetta, I'm Lee Pietro, uh, obviously from the accent, not from Italy, I'm from Scotland, from the James Hutton <laughs> Institute. I'm an agroecologist. I'm largely here as part of his charming assistant. Uh, but I, I have an interest, a big interest, uh, in sustainable systems, sustainable system design, particularly the role of lichens in sustainable system design. Do you want to say a few words? Or? Yeah, so Before we start into the... Okay, I'd just like to introduce you a little bit, because some of you don't know the British Ecological Society. The British Ecological Society is um, the oldest ecological society in the world, I think. And a hundred years ago, when it started up, those people were quite cutting edge. So they, you know, traditionally people have looked at the biology of individual species. And at that point they started to think about systems, about the role of species and systems and how they interact. And that was a very... Um, innovative approach at the time and the, the society continues to support scientists and practitioners who work, who work in conservation, in agroecology, in really quite um, traditional scientific um, institutions as well and it supports research, research through grants and it has knowledge exchange, it, support, it has journals um, and it's got a really wide membership and our group is the Agriculture and Ecology Group and within the group, there's a really wide spectrum of people. People who are um, looking at GM crops, really industrial agriculture, all the way through to people who are looking at gardening and polyculture and gardening systems. And the really important thing for us, and why we're so interested in this workshop, is we're interested in how we can understand those whole systems and how we can compare them. Because just as those people in the so 100 years ago, we're standing back and looking at the whole system. Now we're standing back even further and saying, OK, well, what about the people? What about um, other socioeconomic conditions? It's not just about looking at small parts of the system. We need to look at the whole. And so as Les says, what we're interested in is looking at common metrics that we can develop so we can really compare those systems and really know the benefit of permaculture or agroecology or any other kind of sustainable farming system. I would say that... Um, the society is open to anybody. Anyone can be part of the agroecology group, um, and you're very welcome to join. And if you put your um, email on this piece of paper, I will add you to the mailing list. And you'd be very welcome to come along to any of our events, you know, many of which are free. And thank you for coming today, and I hope we have a really productive morning. Mm -hmm. okay. So Pete's going to set the scene well, now. I just made some very quick notes this morning. Um, I met Andy Goldring about <coughs> four or so years ago. And um, we're into, in research, we're into having experimental platforms where we can go and gather evidence. 
and I asked Andy, does it have any experimental platforms? And, and there were no there were no formal experimental platforms available. So <coughs> research that was a big problem. There are of course lots of permaculture platforms out there, but the data that's being gathered isn't in the context of of the peer reviewed literature, which is what the government seems to listen to, even though the grey literature is enormous, it's huge. So you know, if you go into Google Scholar or Web of Knowledge, you'll, there are some facts I think we need to appreciate who drive them home. There is no peer reviewed evidence base for permaculture. That's a fact. There's none. Um, but yet, permaculture is arguably um, that form of production which, which most accurately meets the criteria of sustainable intensification or sustainable de intensification, as I would prefer to call it. So, what sets permaculture apart? For me, and, and, and the debate will go on. But how we conceive permaculture is, I think, important if we're going to research it. We need to know what we're researching and how it distinguishes itself from the other forms of environmental focused research that's going on. So, to me, it aims to be ethical without being religious. Um, the, it wants <clears throat> ethics to determine business and not business to determine ethics. It reconnects the general public um, with cultivation. I think uh, it fosters pastoral care. And um, so I think to affect government policy, the peer reviewed literature, we, um, we, we're obviously going beyond production in the environment. There's a very strong human element to what we do. And certainly the research I see, there, are, there is human and nutrition research going on, human well being research going on. But to me, there's a, a disjunct between this connection with the production unit. So, we're well, seeing, um, I think, the study of agricult agricultural systems widening to include those human elements, extending right from, um, it's not just uh, fork to, you know, farm to fork, it's, it's after it's consumed and what happens upstream. Um, for me as a researcher, that's a huge job. How do we get money to do big studies like that? But I think Les will go on to talk about the uh, indicators that are for global sustainability. But I think modelling and life cycle analysis um, has, has a, a strong part to play in. Indicators of, of environmental and human health, I think, will have a role to play. So hopefully in the course of this, we'll, we'll work up some um, ideas that we could focus on for our future research agenda. Um, I think we need to define what permaculture research is. Um, what its research priorities should be, and um, how does it fit with industrial ecology? <coughs> does it fit? I don't even have a picture really of baselines of what the current state of permaculture is. What, what form, how can we characterize the, the, the current permaculture community? That's a good thing to do because then we can watch how it changes and evolves, and that in itself is informed. But anyway, I'll, I've talked enough. I'll hand you over. I hope that sets some sort of scene. My background is a bit different, and the key question and the key process that's going on that I'm in the reason why I'm here is that internationally there's a lot of work on developing metrics and standards for sustainable agriculture. That's partly driven by the G20, so there's a G20 process. That's partly driven by the EU. Because currently we have a thing called the Farm Business Survey, and there is development on adding environmental modules to this business survey. It's driven, to be honest, probably most of all by the food chain. So companies such as PepsiCo, Unilever, Waitrose, Marks and Spencers, they're investing a huge amount of resource into developing the appropriate metrics for what their sustainable food production line is. <coughs> now, because these debates are happening now, there's a real opportunity for everybody to get involved. So it's not a case of do you agree or not with some of these other systems, but it's a case of how would you, what the basis is that you would like the systems to be compared. So, so this isn't about who will win any particular games, but, the, but we're in a process of setting the rules. And all we've got to do, we only have a couple of hours this morning, so this is just going to give a snapshot of ideas 
that will then feed into other dialogues that are going on. Okay, so hopefully you've got a bit of an idea of kind of where we're coming from in organising this session and what we hope to do today. So we're going to start with a couple of practitioner uh, talks. So these are people who are permaculture practitioners um, that are starting to do research or have been doing in some cases for a long time research about what they're doing. So I'd first like to introduce you to Graham Griffin, who runs Griffin Food Forest, which is based in... Gawla, South Australia. In South Australia. <laughs> um, um, we'll see if we can get that image going. Yeah. Because I might have to okay. make that image for that. Yeah. So I think it's just... Giddy. Scroll down. You reckon we could yeah. maybe get some of those lights on? Beautiful. Um, thanks very much um, for having me for uh, about five minutes. So I'm going to have to whiz through this um, quite fast. Uh, the food forest is a 20 hectare farm in Adelaide. So it's in the city of Adelaide uh, on the northern boundary. And uh, we, our nutrition is run on the waste of the city. So composted urban waste gives us our nutrients. Um, and uh, increasingly... Uh, urban runoff, stormwater will be our, our water source uh, and with all of that we've got to produce a certified organic product. Um, we've done bits and pieces of bucket chemistry research. So this is uh, research when you're not really a scientist. Uh, it's research when you want to know whether you're actually producing well or you're producing badly, whether you're wasting energy whether you're wasting water, etc. So I just wanted to go through a few um, examples. Um, we, I, I, I will be talking at another session um, tomorrow uh, about the actual way that we measure the energetics of the farm and that sort of thing. But these are just some snapshots of the gear that we've been doing. And we'll just see if this will behave. Okay, so example one is um, a little tiny... Uh, kangaroo uh, called a betong, uh, which uh, is uh, an endangered species in Australia. And our thought was, could we actually incorporate a threatened species into an agricultural system successfully? Um, and and uh, so we chucked four in, and uh, over a period of years, we, we reached a climax of about 80 animals on, on 20 acres. Um, and uh, one of the amazing things about it that we learned because you know there was no uh, model for us to follow at all. Um, the government told us that they would let us have two betongs on 20 acres because that was all that could be done. Uh, and we said thank you very much and put four in. <laughs> and away they went. And Bruce the boy uh, was obviously very virile because we, we increased <laughs> our population fantastically. And we found that the betongs actually um, dug up the bulbs of this, uh, this awful... I don't know if I'm in a really good spot here. This awful weed. Um, sorry to any South Africans that are here, but it's been a bust of a weed. In, uh, uh, okay, I'll blame you. Um, uh, terrible, terrible weed. Um, it poisonous to stock and, and just, just horrible. But these little uh, kangaroos would actually dig up the, the bulbs and eat them. Um, and, and that was just a completely unexpected outcome of research in action, if you like. And, uh, and so that was uh, one thing. They also dug a lot, and so they roughed up the soil, and they actually displaced a lot of weeds, other weeds as well. So uh, we had two things happening there, and we also found that they increased the uh, burial of uh, native plant seeds around the place. They actively like filled their cheek up with seeds of, of acacia trees and so forth, and bury them, and then want to eat them as they uh, germinate, because they've they become sweet at that point, but with Alzheimer's, a few of them just forgot where these bloody seeds were, and so up came the, the acacia trees. So the, they were a very important part of the ecosystem, and, uh, and then that was restored by just protecting them from foxes. That was all we had to do. The rest was theirs. And no downside that we found at all. They're just very harmonious in the agricultural system. Um, here we, you can see um, uh, up at the top that our farm perched on the side of the Gawler River, and... Uh, it has been um, grazed by livestock and invaded by exotic plants. 
uh, such as the artichoke uh, or thistle that you see there. The whole understory is gone. There are just the big red gum trees. And so the ecosystem is being demolished at ground level. And so we've gone in, we've taken out all of the nasties, things like a puntia, which is also known as prickly pear, and, uh, and castor oil bush, and, the, and then the, uh, um, the thistles and so on, and, and, and put back uh, native ecosystems. So in the bottom right hand slide, you can see the, the little plant guards that we've put over new, newly planted uh, grasses and, uh, and other plants. And we have seen uh, certainly more visits by kangaroos and so forth, but more importantly, we've been able to uh, count the birds uh, in the system. Really, really easy. These guys would say, hey, probably not valid, but we've gone from about 10 common species through to 95. So um, I think that's evidence okay. enough for us. So, so a permaculturist does not have to be a farmer, uh, sorry, a, a scientist to be able to do this. We've got another one, another little play that we're going to make, which is to try and get the university to breed some micro sheep, some really, really tiny sheep like this, so that they will, they'll be able to graze underneath the, the grapevines and the fruit trees without harming them. And, and whilst we can have very, very specific grazing by geese, uh, who only really like eating grasses, uh, the sheep will eat the broadleafed plants as well. So they're more like a, a mower. So you don't get the imbalance in the ecosystem in your pasture. Um, what else are we doing? Um, well, global warming. Uh, two out of our last four pistachio crops have failed because the winter has been too warm. Um, and so we thought, well, okay, we've been growing these trees for 25 years. This is what our main crop is. We are financially buggered if we don't get, do something about this. So we've managed to get a Tunisian variety, which is right down on the sort of Mediterranean, north, northern coast of, of Africa, and, and it is adapted to less chill. Um, and so we have found that, yes, they do work. Now, if we'd gone and tried to do some sort of long-winded scientific trial, uh, it probably would have taken 25 years to kind of get the results, but just by getting hold of the variety, whacking it in, and see if it functions, under really adverse conditions, bingo, we, we hit gold there as well. Um, we've also had a look at whether um, we can actually protect trees in our agricultural system using sunscreen. So this is very finely ground um, calcium carbonate, so just limestone, and we found that we can get a 5 degree centigrade reduction in surface temperature of fruit and leaves uh, by just squirting it with, uh, with this stuff. And even better, we managed to get uh, organic certification for that product at the same time. So we actually gave the a capacity of all organic farmers to use that product. Um, and um, yes, okay, it's, it, it's a, an artificial uh, additive in the system, but there's quite a bit of limestone in the world. And if any of you who came across from Europe will have noticed vast cliffs of limestone. So it's one of the things that we do actually have, you know, plenty of. Um, a, a, another thing which has got nothing to do with ecology apart from that we add water to our system. So we have a 400 millimeter per year rainfall and a 2000 millimeter evaporation. So our permaculture system needs a bit of extra water. Um, we, we, our, and everyone is using the subsurface water, the aquifers underlying at the Adelaide Plain to the point where they're all declining and so the thought is, can we get stuff from urban developments, water that's going to go off down the river very quickly during a, a big rain event um, back into uh, productive use in, in the ecosystem where it, it sort of, I mean, we're interfering with nature to a degree. And this is just what, what I'll be looking at um, in the paper I give uh, tomorrow. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think we've seen a little whiz shot through there of different ways of doing research, different practical approaches, different ways to evaluate research as well. So, um, thank you very much for that. For uh, our second uh, practitioner, I'd like to introduce you to Beck Lowe. Beck 
has a permaculture farm. She's a permaculture uh, practitioner and teacher in Victoria, Australia. <laughs> by coincidence, we two Australians so around the world collaboration of <laughs> our meeting. Um, and she's looking at integrated systems uh, with uh, hens as part of those. So, I'll just move it on to Good morning. Good morning. I'm still a bit jet lagged, so if I'm not coherent. I apologise. I've already made a big stuff up and not put my presentation onto my flash drive like I thought ahead. So no pretty pictures for you. Um, I have got another one. I might actually just get that up, and if it works, it works. But I'll just talk in the meantime. No, maybe not, because I haven't got a password. Okay, so part of this research came for me really... Um, as I said, I just said to Naomi, I'm a bit of a nerd who likes getting my hands dirty. So uh, my original degree was a Bachelor of Science, so I really like hearing about evidence and, and knowing about things, but I'm also very much a practical person. Um, and my special area of interest has always been um, animals. Yep. Like that. Um, so after, let's see, it would have been about... 12 years of setting up my permaculture system in central Victoria. Um, I can scroll down. Here we are. I can do the work from here, I think. Another slideshow. Cool. All right. Let's see how we go with this. Um, yeah, after about 12 years, I was starting to, to miss some of that academic stuff. I'm a bit nerdy in that I like reading academic papers and finding out what's going on. So I enrolled in a Master's of sustainable agriculture in Australia and pretty much found there wasn't much research available on permaculture systems. So that led me to doing some of my own research. The reason I wanted to highlight this little bit, it was a very discreet project. It went over just a couple of months. It was um, very specific to one aspect of my system, but it did generate results that I could statistically analyse and actually come out with, with a result. And it's a good example of something anyone could potentially do, depending on their system. I did it while I was at university, which the main thing that gave me is actually the impetus to do it. I probably, it was something I would have liked to have done, but it was only because I was enrolled that I actually got around to doing it. Ironically, it never became part of my degree because it didn't get through the animal welfare um, committee in time. I think it probably would have, but they needed months and months and months of leading to analyse any of those um, projects coming through before they gave it the go-ahead. Uh, okay, so what I did was had a look at, sorry, this is a presentation for something else, so I'll just flick through most of these. Um, here we go. I looked at chickens in two different agroecosystems. So... Here we go. Here's a, this is a more recent picture of our place, um, but it's still much the same. What we've got is a fenced-in area, like Graham, with fox proofing. And this is our little food forest in here. So we've got a range of temperate and Mediterranean species. There's mostly apples in here, uh, backed up with a lot of nurse plants, like tegacesti, there's various acacias. Um, a decent understory, but not a very good one. Um, we've got a lot of Mediterranean herbs and things in there. Um, we've also got a paddock out here, or field, which is also run along the same lines, as in no chemicals or anything. But as yet, it has, as you can see, no structural diversity, although there's quite a good diversity of ground covers. Um, and what we did, we've got two sheds. We got the chickens to run two sets of chickens. 40 chickens in each shed to make it statistically significant. One of these sheds led straight into this food forest. The other shed led out into the paddock. So the main thing I was going to test was the food consumption of these two chickens. So pretty much all the previous studies on free-range chickens have been done comparing them to battery chickens, not like with like. So this was a Unique study, in effect, because it was looking at one different system with another different system instead of battery chickens versus free-range chickens. So, one of the, um, the biggest inputs 
into a, a chicken system, particularly a free one to one, is the food. That's the, by far the highest input, both in environmental um, inputs and financial inputs. So if we can reduce the feed, um, I figure that's going to make more viable but more humane chicken systems. So a free range chicken tends to eat a lot more than a standard battery chicken because it's running around, it's using energy, it's doing things. Um, and also because it has to keep itself a bit warmer or cooler. It's got to thermoregulate, whereas most battery chickens don't have to do that because they're in a big shed where the temperature is controlled. So that's a big argument um, that I've heard used in favour of battery chickens, saying, you know, it's more sustainable because you have to feed them less. So, what we did, identical sheds, they had access to a standard formulated feed, so that was just the feed produced by a local foot stock feeds company. Weighed all the hens at the start and the end. Also weighed the eggs over a period at the start and the end. And another thing I was also looking at was the distance from the shed. One of the issues in free range farming, egg farming, is chickens actually don't like going out of sheds. Naturally, they're a jungle bird, they like to have a bit of dappled shade, they don't want to be out in the big wide world, it's dangerous for them. So even um, quite good free range egg farms often have this issue that the chickens just don't want to range. And if you know something about the personality of a chicken, you can understand why. Okay, so the first thing I noticed was there's a big difference to where, to where they were on range. I can send this to you um, if you're having trouble reading it. So this is um, a week one. Uh, they had a week to just, week zero, they just got settled. Week one I had a look at where they were and then at the end, week seven, I had a look at where they were. So group A are the ones that got to be in the food forest. You see the vast majority, even at group week one, were out and about in that food forest, whereas the majority of those in the paddock were still pretty much in the shed. Um, and it didn't change terribly much over the time. Eventually some of these birds in the paddock did start to get out and about, but predominantly the food forest was utilised by the chickens and the paddock wasn't. One of the interesting things were, was there was no difference in food intake between the two groups. So it's an interesting result, partly because we know the chickens that are in the food forest have been moving more, spending more energy because they were out and about, whereas the ones who had the paddock weren't out and about, so they were spending less energy. But on the other hand, there's obviously something balancing that. So it might be the amount of food available in the food forest, or the type of food that those chickens were able to, um, to find, forage for themselves. And it might also be because they had a better temperature regulation. Because those sheds weren't artificially regulated, the chickens in the food forest could go and find a shady spot if it was hot, whereas the ones who were in the shed and paddock couldn't. So there's a number of factors there that I wasn't able to pull apart just within that little experiment, um, but interesting. Also, no difference in the weight of chickens. And it was an interesting result. The main result I was actually looking for was, you know, difference in, in feed consumption. But the statistically significant result I got that I didn't expect was the size of the eggs of all things. So here we have a t-test for those who know their statistics. Um, so there's a statistical difference between group A in the orchard, group B in the pasture at week seven, but also between group A at the start and the end. So again, there's not a lot, I couldn't pull those factors apart within the experimental design. Um, so it could be partly what they were eating, whether they were able to gather more protein, because they were, had more diverse microclimates in the little food forest. It might be that there were various herbs in the food forest that increased egg production. So some research I've found did talk about feeding different herbs to chickens to increase the egg size. Um, and there is also an outside possibility that because I wasn't able to analyse the number of eggs successfully because we had a couple of egg eating chooks and a couple of crows come in, that egg size may have been outbalanced by egg number, but I don't know. But it's just worth noting that in there. Okay, so that's 
pretty much it in a nutshell. <laughs> if anyone's got a little question or an eggshell, thank you for that <laughs> smart <laughs> person out there to crack a joke. <laughs> <laughs> have a laugh. <laughs> no, I have one. Yeah. How, how old were the birds at the beginning of the trial? Um, they were just at the end of their natural life. The only way I could afford this many birds was to buy them from a free-range chicken farm just before they were being taken off to be killed. So they would have been between 18 months and two years. So the food forest didn't come up with astounding results? Didn't come up, it's not outstanding, but interesting, I find. What and numbers? Numbers, hmm? numbers of eggs. No, as I said, I couldn't do numbers of eggs accurately because there was a couple of egg eaters in there and we had some crows coming in. So I did start gathering that data and then decide, no, that's that's going to skew it if the crows only coming into one egg thing. So, yeah, it's a real shame that I haven't got that data because I think that would add a lot in there. What was this question from the back? Yeah, now you said the uh, three metres for the chickens. Do you have any numbers on how far they actually ran, went into the forest? Not really, because um, if you see this picture, this is how I could see how far they were. Once they're actually in that food forest, it's actually very hard to see where they were. Um, but they could have gone a maximum of probably 20 metres within that, and a maximum of a lot, much lot, almost infinity out the other way. But it was a bit hard to tell once they got over three metres. There are a couple of questions there, but I'm not sure if you're allowed to ask them, or you might have to yeah, ask them later. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think we're going to So I'll hand over now to you for the next yeah, one. Can we? Oh, I forgot a lot. Daylight is great. Um, I'm back low. Just look for my tag and you can ask me later. Uh, just listening to those two talks, I was writing down the indicators that they've used. I've got biodiversity in terms of species richness and population size of selected species. I've got food quality and quantity, if you regard egg size as a map of quality. Uh, soil pH came in, one of your indicators. There's the location. I'm not sure what that is an indicator of, but you clearly felt that was an important thing to measure. Well, Because that was about the use of the habitat. Humane um, animal systems, it's an indicator. There's an indicator of the water, the sustainability of the water supply, whether it's urban or other source, uh, the amount of feed, and, and also the, the amount of feed intake. There were two indicators buried in there. One was the actual amount, but the other one that you mentioned was the cost of, of that. So it was an economic indicator as well as simply some measure of calories or something else. Now, what I want you to do now is, for the next five minutes, don't talk to anybody, but if there's three broad indicators like that that you want to see going forward, which are they? And don't forget to think back to the talks that we had in the plenary, which were dealing with rather larger scale issues. Potentially the, the, the potential to transform society, the potential to manage global environmental change. Or, you might, or there might be something very specific that you're concerned with. But only three. Off you go. Okay. Yeah. And we'll be spreading the post-its around so you can scribble them on post-its. They are not colour-coded. Yeah. Keep them separate. So one one indicator per post-it, please. <laughs> well, if we run out of post-its, remember what they are, because we're, we're going to be spreading them around. I'm going to take take three. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
That's up to you. You know the context. Um, I'll read them out again, but... Can you do it in a special way rather than all the treats? It's too hard to take it. I understand it. Yeah. So, biodiversity. Food quality and quantity. Soil pH. Water supply. Feed intake. <coughs> quantity and cost. And they're the main ones that just came out of these two case studies. So if you think in terms of, the, of your own situation, if you wanted to sell how well your system is doing to a sceptical public, what do you want to tell them? Yeah, 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 that's good. How to, me how to measure success. And most of you will think of far more than three, but three makes it manageable for this morning. I think I could ask a big query I have about what we heard. It's that the food consumption of people between the two, but one of them spent all their time in the forest. So where did they eat? <coughs> well, that is. <coughs> No, 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 that's a technical thing. We'll come back. You, you can ask over lunch. Yeah, for a 
Oh, we'll get late. Do you need more time, people? Everybody? Yeah. One or two of you do. But I don't know how well this is going to work because this is a very crowded room. But we'll try it anyway. So we're all going. We are going to attach ourselves to one of these uh, whiteboard things around there. So you'll spread yourselves out. Yeah. I'll check them out. And what we're going to do is, we're going to, each one of these will have a separate topic area, and I want you to move around and figure out which, and put the post it according to the topic area that you think that particular indicator fits. No, you can't both have one. That's silly. Why don't we just Ah, all right. So we'll have over there ecology, soil, and water. So from this morning's one, that will include the biodiversity. And it might include pollinators. It's the, the ecosystem services, the natural capital, all that side of things. So, if you think you've got anything for ecology, soil, and water, you can pass it to Not yet, not yet. <laughs> because you need to know the other categories. You might figure that, you might think that they'll fit into the categories better. Economic and social. So, that's very much about the wealth that the system is generating. That might be financial, or it might be some societal benefits. Here, production and human nutrition. So this is about how much is being produced and its quality. And then over there, which is the one that I first came across in, according to this definition, is a perfect permaculture system I found in, came across in Thailand many years ago, about 10 years ago. Don't forget the cultural and spiritual. Which one do you do? You can go over there. Yeah, I'll, no, pens over there. This is for, if you want more, you want to talk Cultural and spiritual. So if you take your post-its and stick them to the ones that you think it fits the best. And try not to cause too much of a jam in the middle. So maybe you could pass them to the people who are standing by the board. So Barbara is collecting uh, economic and social, uh, cultural and spiritual, it's hard because some of them cut across, <laughs> but we'll create connections maybe between them afterwards. <laughs> Uh, 
Got it worked out. Yeah. 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 Ye
I think we'll probably uh, have still a sticker uh, for me. I still want because I have to put it everywhere. External, uh, positive and negative. <laughs> The important choosing to buy the food or not is on will be any lifestyle change. So only anybody could come and it would just be like, you know, a normal sort of thing. Buy into any idea or they would have to some of the posters. So in other words, over there, there's, there's, I saw several biodiversity ones, put them together, and then we can start to get a sense of how much variation we, there is. There isn't room for everybody to do that, but if you're interested in one of these, please just walk up and join in. I'm not saying they've already started, but it's bound to be. There is so much, so you are not allowed to move postings from one board to another.
Who's standing around on this one? First of all, can you count up how many you've got, including the ones that have sort of fallen off? And if everybody does that for me, we've got somebody in each. So how many postings do we have? That's another race sheet. So we've got 35 on the production of human nutrition side, 17 on the cultural and spiritual. How are we going over the RS? How many? 30 plus so far. <laughs> 30 plus? Desperately quantitative, that's about how many we've got over there? That's what it is. So, how many social functions? It's numbers. So, where should we be on? Uh, uh, there are some typical microorganisms for specific type of uh, soil types, and they can be uh, quantified. And it's very interesting. So number of species or number of actual no, organisms? No, some, some typical. Uh, there are some characteristics of key microorganisms that thrive on uh, specific uh, soil types. So it can be divided by area of this uh, soil or by some other criteria, but seal is, seems to be interesting at least. Any idea? <laughs> they've got, they've got lots. <laughs> right, so can we have a bit of quiet? So like someone to talk to each of these, talk through the clusters to see what we've got. So you want to start us off with what you're seeing there? You should be looking at it. Look here and form me. Sits on here like to comment and explain why they put them up. Any? Oh, well, um, I think uh, say something like um, the amount of energy that goes in. Um, if that's much more than the energy that comes out, it's a crap system, isn't it? I mean, you're just yeah. robbing yourself. You're robbing the whole deal. Um, and so it's a terrific measurement. It's one of the most basic measurements if you're actually losing energy in, uh, in the production system. And we're meant to be harvesting energy from the sun and, and using plants and so forth to actually get something. And um, so if we're not doing that, we're running the system down. We're creating probably a whole lot of waste, uh, which is not a really, really good idea. Uh, and also uh, energy often is a surrogate for oil and coal and gas and the more of that energy that we use in creating a unit of food probably the more CO2 is entering our atmosphere and starting to bugger up the climate so I think that's a really good kind of a, a measurement a pretty basic one. But so that's fuel you're talking well, specifically yeah. on? No, no uh, en energy surrogates yeah yeah. Um, I, I Can you shout up? Um, the diversity of yields per hectare, if you only have a monoculture of, of carbohydrates, you still have to ship in your proteins from somewhere else. So if you have a site which is producing um, carbohydrates, proteins, and more mineral rich products, um, then you can get a range of food to people faster with less energy and investment. So it's not just the, the gross amount of yield, it's the diversity yep. of the production. The amount of waste that is, uh, I mean, the amount of nutrition that is wasted because of the place, location of the production. Uh, I'm sorry, my age. No, 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 you're doing fine. Yeah. Uh, I think there is a lot of uh, waste in the nutrition because of the location of the 
place where it is produced to going to the person who has to have the nutrition. So in other words, you're, so you're talking about not just the productivity of yep. the site, the it's nutrition. the potential for losses between that site through the supply chain yes. to the individual. Mm -hmm. till, it, till the nutrition reaches the person. Till, yeah, the so, so it's the productivity yes. by the time it gets to the people that are using yes. the stuff. Yes. I think that area there, having looked at the notes there, represents all forms of inputs versus outputs. Um, and then also, you know, waste management as a result of the sustainability. So, you know, the yield, the quality, um, you know, and then the output of that, and then the waste, and how that can circulate. And that also needs to be measured over time. Um, you know, and location has been important thing too. I don't know if quite fits there because, like, how do you distribute? You know, it's like these are all important factors. Um, for example, current issues, I mean, monocrop systems right now being shipped. Like from like other parts of the world, all over. It's like you know, it's all about location based. So, so I think that that whole thing is about input, output, waste management, and distribution, location. So, I is your, with your the location is your concern just the distance, or is it the energy cost? Is it potential for waste? Does it really matter if we get uh, land from New Zealand? Um, well, I think. You know, it definitely will because I mean the, the 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 cost, the energy cost, the input of that will be you know the difference will be very quite you know quite expensive. So that's the it comes back to the energy costs. Mm -hmm. so. Well, carbon dioxide maybe is more specific carbon. Okay, cost. so the greenhouse gas potential arising from that food system. So we've got the waste from the food system and the erosion of renewable resource, non-renewable resources. Okay. Um, I've also considered in terms of the footprint of the amount of area of land that's used to produce our food because the rest is what's left for nature and there's not very much left and increasingly less over time. So that's why the, one of the reasons why the efficiency matters. It's the type of energy we are using. So if it is renewable energy, that is one point. And how many times the energy output exchange is happening. How many times the same energy can be used again and again? This is an important consideration. Yeah? Oh, no, I'm just recording for the media uh, team. Oh, that's uh, really yeah. helpful. <laughs> uh, what I haven't heard yet is food quality. Yeah. Is that in there? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that is in there. Yeah. What, what do we mean by food quality? Yield. The nutritional yield, energy, taste, taste. taste. minerals, vitamins, so the micronutrients. There's a return to source indication there as well. So whatever you're growing in terms of canopy, you need it. There's a loop system back into the soil itself, both from the plants and also the animals in that environment. So you've got things in terms of food, nutrition, benefit. It might not be beneficial to the local ecosystem. Toxicity. Mm. Toxicity. Yeah. Um, Mollison said we shouldn't bother about testing the soil. We should just test what we eat, which might be contentious. The next thing would be to look at human health indicators in relation to that diet. Mm. Okay, so we've now got the whole supply chain from the quantity of yield that's produced the diversity of the production, the composition of that production, its route through the supply chain in terms of both wastes and energy and carbon efficiencies, and in terms of the impact on the, on the health of the people at the far end. Did we, um, permaculturists think something about keeping everything in the system, but if you're gonna compare it with an ultimate system, are we putting in anything there about runoffs of fertilizer or the bio? I suspect we'll get over the. I suspect they'll be over there. But if things turn up, if, if people disagree with where the post it goes, well, that's really not an issue. As long as we capture stuff somewhere. The faeces is a production on a site, which is actually a very interesting indicator of what type of biomass is evident and also the extent to which it's a nutrient. 
happens. I think as a, as a part of the production process, the great gradients are like present perhaps in the it's actually divided into the richest soil. So in other words, it's, as, from my point of view as a scientist, you're saying it's the it's the health of the biogeochemical cycles at the site. Yeah. Mm. I'm not sure if we've got that on there, but if not, we'll put that there. Yeah. But can we go around cultural and spiritual? What have you got? Yeah, 17 here. Um, everything's connected. A couple of them, I think, fall in a hinterland between some of these areas. Um, but we've got quite a few just simply talking about happiness and how we quantify happiness. <coughs> Uh, and quality of life. Um, there are also some one here on human well-being indicators. There are some scientific methods I'm not emerging on that. A curious one to me is spiritual well-being. I have no idea how you <laughs> might quantify soul, but I'd be happy to discuss it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, Who put that one in? I didn't put it in, but I find it interesting that you said I have no idea how I would quantify that because just because you're measuring a change in something doesn't mean it has to be a quantifiable change. But if you if it's uh, spiritual well being is obviously something that people can conceive. Yeah, but you could say I feel more spiritual. Sure, it could be captured subject. It could be captured subjectively. It could be one. Doesn't have to be objectively. Still quantified. Yeah. In a just if a million people say they're happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could say spirit is a difficult thing to capture the number of people who are pursuing that goal. <laughs> There's there's research in the UK as well on the measurable health benefits of exposure to the countryside. Even to the point if you put a, a, a photograph of a, a nice landscape in a hospital ward, people will recover a little bit faster. Another aspect uh, to be almost half of these relate to care for animal well being. Sorry, okay. I'm I'm animal husbandry and animal well being. Okay. So, when we talk about culture and spiritual benefits, it's not just for the human individual. And a good, it's a, approximately half of these want to quantify the, animals, the animal state. So, there's other ones here that really touch on, on some of the other ones. Um, attitude change, which I think is definitely social. Uh, what people will eat. It's kind of interesting, that one. Personal story, when I say to my mother, how are you? She's a Southern Italian. She says, well, for breakfast, I'm a this. <laughs> and then she says, for lunch, I'm a this. I believe we'll ask how you are. She says, I'm telling you. <laughs> so, but there's, a, there's an awful lot, yeah, I, I, I personally am a bit surprised there's still, I know my own research industry is a disjunct between us as agroecologists and the, uh, the social scientists. Because there's a big push now, there's more money for social science, and what a lot of scientists are doing are saying, get a social scientist on board, but there's a route to the money. And then they get the social scientist to do some, to my mind, quite naughty, patronizing, stupid, and quite inconsequential <laughs> survey of people's attitudes. It was actually something far more sophisticated could be done. So it's not being done, people are ticking the box, get the social scientists on board, get the money to hell with the significance or impact of what they're doing. So some, I think there's an opportunity there to be explained. Yeah, that relates to the question I have, days, and there's new research about gut bacteria that resemble soil bacteria. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think it relates a bit more to the spiritual cultural one because it comes from indigenous 
I mean, there's some research into health in terms of indigenous knowledge of health. So I wonder if you want to go beyond attitudes and behavior, I mean, what we eat, we are what we eat, if it's true that we resemble the soil of the food we eat in terms of our own So biological material, parallels between... Becoming, we becoming yeah. the food we are. Yeah. So that would open up a, a total new dimension to culture and spiritual. Mm -hmm. Related to health, but also to it's our location within mm -hmm. ecological landscapes and our role in them. Yeah. So, microorganisms we know are very oh, useful indicators. Oh, you have a question? Yeah. Oh, no, I have a comment, by the way. Uh, it just came to my mind that I heard from many people, and uh, it's also my own experience, that when you are moving to the countryside, your net consumption of food, food intake, uh, reduces dramatically. Sometimes uh, by, uh, by times, you know. And it can be another, perhaps, a spiritual indicator, because uh, you can eat less, both in economic <coughs> money terms and in uh, uh, weight terms. Yeah. As for me, as for my family, I can uh, say for sure that it's a double-fold decrease. Mm. Well. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not quite sure about the difference between cultural and social, but anyway, uh, there are people involved in practicing permaculture, so you can look at the permaculture as a system. Uh, Agroecology is one way, one way to sort of connect science to permaculture, but uh, another group we've got involved very deeply, very quickly, are anthropologists, because they are used to studying groups of people. And so uh, we look at how uh, the permaculture lifestyle relates to other citizen agroecology movements, other activist movements, other farming techniques like the organic movement. Uh, so we put it in context and also relate it to other bodies of knowledge that are closely related. Yeah, I mean, there's actually quite a few, and again, I don't know which one it fits with. I mean, there's a few documentaries, I think one's called Food Matters, that shows uh, people's health based on a period of time, like after the Second World War and food production during those times, and, and people across different geographical locations with the, the health impact and, and the way where they get their food from the production. Uh, another one is happiness, and again, showing geographical locations and trying to measure people's happiness, showing, you know, how much happiness does a person who is living basically in a slum but has a large family versus a guy working in you know, New York? What, you know, how do you measure their happiness and their, their life longevity? Or longevity? Um, so these are, I think these are pretty measurable things. And, you know, it's it's how we time have that scheme, don't they, where they, they introduce things to the population that are special. If, if they agree, it's, it makes them happy, but it's done. It doesn't make them happy. Can I ask, why don't you be put happiness up here? Were you talking about the happiness of those people producing the food? Those people consuming the food? Everybody? Whose happiness are we talking about? I have not come in there, but uh, you gave an example of your mother when you asked her how much did she say how much So I think uh, happiness can be measured spontaneously when you ask a question to somebody, how are you? They should be able to just say, I'm happy. When that's the spontaneous answer, I think that's a lot. That's a vision. I was wondering, I suppose I'm relating it to the person or people that are included in the system, whatever the system might be. So whether they're a, a recipient of the production at the end or whether they actually end the production of it. So. Right, so I want to make sure everybody's heard that because I think this is a really important point. Because the point here is that the system isn't just the people that are producing food, but it's Everybody involved in the food chain explicitly? Does that include people who might just eat it casually on a street bar or whatever? Or if I can take us a little bit further, um, I mean, it doesn't mean, it means very much the transformation of what we consider research and how we put the system boundaries. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of, to me, it's very important to stress this that. Also, the kinds of categories that were created here in the workshop, I think there, there are a lot of ways to cross-cut them and to have indicators that are indicative rather than, you know, separating, as in the methodology of, of kind of the dominant methodology of, of rational design. And I think it's, um, it shouldn't just be like the natural scientists against the social scientists, but rather really trying to collaborate and really valuing each other's qualities and perspectives. Can we come back to this point about integrative indicators that could cross these? 
I think it would be helpful to finish going around these separate ones and then explore that in more detail. How long have we got? <laughs> um, I have broken it down a little bit. So there were 20 plus under biodiversity, um, which included nematodes, insect counts, tree counts, and biomass supported, whatever that is. There were around about 15 on water quality, um, which included recycling, retention, moisture within the soil. Then there were another 15 on soil quality, which includes stored carbon, ability to continue without input, and a number of other similar types of things. There were about half a dozen on the eco footprint versus yield, which you can again cut a number of different ways. And then there was a very small subsection, probably only three, but on weather resilience, which was quite an interesting one. Um, you know, if you've got a storm, do you lose the lot? Are they grapes or are they pomegranates and they're likely to go to frost instead? I don't know. So that was about it. Any particular questions? The resilience one. What were people thinking about that? that that's great. I was thinking the inability to buffer the extremes of climate change in a less predictable world, so through for over time, longitudinal, uh, over droughts, or water scarcity, or bigger winds as we get in the spring. You may or may not be surprised to know that that's zooming to the top of the big supermarket indicators. Is it? Oh, there. Because they're seriously concerned about the resilience of the supply chain, the global supply chain. So. And of course that rests upon the resilience of what happens in each individual field. Yeah. And that's partly to do with what crops you grow, partly to do with how you do it. But you might, ten years ago, that was probably the kind of indicator that would have been just in this sort of room. But now all the big players are desperate to get a handle on that one. Yeah, I, I put that up as well. Uh, you really only understand how a system, how, how, how it works when it's under stress. So, uh, if you take a recent example of the European Union, it's just had a, a, a huge financial shock and it's had a, now a big cultural shock and it's not responding very well. It's very apparent now where the weaknesses are. And it's the same with uh, a farming system or anything like that. So, uh, and that comes down to uh, measurement. We need to measure how these uh, a farming, uh, for instance, if it's a, a permaculture system versus another system, would it would it respond better when it's when there's been a, a thumping great drought or a frost or something like that? Can I ask about resilience? What time scale are people thinking about? Is it the capacity to bounce back during the current season, or is it the capacity to bounce back in the next ten years, hundred years, what? It's all of them. 10 to 20, initially, given our latitude, we're getting weather near in the case, we're getting the extremes. So, but where are you? Else, I'm in uh, New South Wales, and we're getting floods and droughts and everything. But the other thing is, I'd like to have a look at the design, because I believe the design is part of resilience. So, it's your wind breaks and your buffer zones, it's your pest management. So, the design of that system is what permaculture adds to it, which is going to Resilience the time. For me, resilience is far shorter town. I think it's only like the Scottish Islands, they used to be entirely self sufficient. Yeah. Now they're about 10% self sufficient. <laughs> we we're, we're, what, we're what, two weeks away or something like that from riots on the streets? So we used to, in the same way that we used to return things to our system, we used to store food. We don't store food, we don't preserve food in the way we did it. So we're it's not an end product of mm. lack of agricultural systems with inbuilt resilience but design mm. resilience. Mm. Because they haven't got it, you're just getting it from somewhere else that has. So to me, so part of the resilience story is losing our capacity yeah. to process and preserve food yeah. Yeah. as individuals. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's diversity part of this resilience question. Yeah. If you have monoculture yeah. and cross culture and you don't get any cherry, oh, there's hail and you don't get any cherries. As an ecologist, the question is, does diversity contribute to resilience?
the evidence for that is actually nowhere near as good as everyone would like it to be. Uh, the, the, in fact, the best, apparently one example where it does, which I came across just on uh, last week, much to my surprise, is the diversity of human gut bacteria. Because that declines as you get older, and so your so one's tendency to have gut problems goes up. The problem with the diversity is that yes, diversity is good, but often we don't need very much as long as it's well managed. So this is more, I guess, it's crossed with the ecology and the production. They all, all of these cross, to some degree or other. Yeah. So. Well, I was going to say that. Um, Seed saving is also part of that resilience and making sure that different varieties are planted for different potential seasons. So, you know, one year you might get one variety doing really well, and if you just plant that the next year because it did well, it might be a different season and you won't get the same results. So, that's another part of it. So, it's the genetic diversity which might be, uh, in terms of livestock, it might be increasing the range of species we use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's also banking on, on um, you know, high high protein productive seed is you know, like, eating meat is one thing where you might need a bit of diversity and resilience there. But they're they're I'm talking. I suppose I'm talking about annual crops. Um, Not necessarily. <laughs> well, well dress their thighs. What what I was saying when I said seed saving is I think it's really really important with annual crops not to put all your eggs in one basket in each season. I and mean, I'm sure there'll be plenty of papers of this convergence about exactly that. That if you only plant one variety of potatoes and you get light, then this stuff can switch. Can we go to... Yeah. Oh, sorry, go on. Uh, I think uh, the resilience can begin from... Uh, depends on the different species we put. Uh, there are some species we, uh, which uh, uh, can yield within a week, some within three months, some within six months, and some a year. So the resilience can begin anytime, depending on the different diversity of species you would put. So it's the diversity of the system through time yeah. as well as the integration of different yeah. diversity of species. Yeah. Actually, before going on to the next bit, it's worth mentioning that. You know, that is a huge number of people have put biodiversity as a major thing. I know, that's why I wanted the counts, because that is an indicator in itself. Because in the mainstream agricultural indicator discussions, biodiversity is falling away. And not least because it's very hard to measure, and also it's quite difficult to relate biodiversity levels unanimously to production systems. So we can model the impacts of fertilizer applications in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. That's quite quite easy. Modeling the, the effects of those in terms of biodiversity impacts very much depends on the place, the watershed, all these things, what species are there. So it's, so it's, it's, it's tough. So to have a high number of people putting something like that down is an important outcome of this discussion. Not just the direct effects of biodiversity either, because you have a local increase in biodiversity, but if you increase or decrease your immediate thought, you'll have indirect effects as well on the same So, related to that, I would. You just have to shout up! Sorry. Related to that, what I'm interested in is measuring the pathways between some of these indicators as well. So, for example, if you have something like you look at pollination, pollination might lead to a lack of seed set. Then farmers may not be able to save seeds, and then you get lack of crop diversity. So I don't know how, you know, I think measuring those pathways between them is also really important. I think um, not only the measurements of the diversity of the organisms, but also their processes and functions. For example, if we measure, for example, how, how many earthworms are there, I mean, that's in, in that sort of system, but also how how it produces casts to um, uh, re re redistribute the I mean to re redistribute the nutrient cycling and also to um, accumulate uh, carbon. I think the um, 
the, the diversity itself is really important, but so it can reflect the, for example, the plant nutrient availability and, and the productivity. So it can be a link for a systematic um, survey or measurement. <coughs> so it's the functional diversity. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, perhaps yes. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Refer to you uh, forming a database by using climate animals, I think, go a long way to uh, give more diversity. Uh, resiliency to the system since we have already messed up with a lot of things everywhere. Can you all hear that? Yeah, right. It's research into uh, how different species will respond to climate change. So, in other words, the resilience is about not only the species that you've got there now, but the species that you might expect still to be there or to have moved in in 50 years' time. Is that right? Uh, most of biodiversity is being lost to agricultural land expansion and most of that happens within the tropics because that's where most of the biodiversity is. So actually the, part, the amount of biodiversity you can retain within an ag agricultural landscape is relatively little, particularly in the temperate regions. Um, so that's why it's really important to get high productivity so your overall footprint for, the, for humanity's reproduction is relatively small. And, and I think jury is still out as well agriculture is really completely conventional agriculture, but that's what I'm studying for my PhD, so I'm, and I've done global mapping of this, and you know, it's, it's really an important thing that permaculture needs to try and solve, because they're one of the people who can do it. The dilemma, though, is that measuring resilience on a small farm scale is not very appropriate. It has to be measured on a watershed or micro watershed scale or land earth scale. That is one. And second is because pharmaculture is measuring, uh, trying to include more trees into the system. By definition, trees take a long time to become mature and when they are destroyed, you are losing a lot of wealth. So I think we need to focus more on understory crops, the shops, rather than only the trees. But we don't talk enough about shrubs which actually regenerate much faster. For example, PGNP, Kajanas Kajan or something like that. That will generate much faster. So, so it always and comes back to the point that was made earlier about getting the time scale yeah. of the system correct. Exactly. But also there's a structural diversity element here which I don't think has come out before. Mm. Yeah, I think the overall theme probably like Again, I want to come back to this one because this is most of the indicate most of the discussion so far, it's actually quite ambiguous which is good or bad. So for instance, high local biodiversity might imply low biodiversity elsewhere. So the interpretation of the indicators might be that it might vary between different philosophies of different systems. And that's fine, but you're getting on to having a value system over and above that in terms of what's actually going to be healing what is. What have we got over there? Sorry, can I just come back on that one point? Because one of the things I've been doing is working with John Neal on the Leash plateau. And one of the interesting things about that comes down to scale and, and the importance of scale in terms of the interventions that take place. And, it, and there's quite clearly a correlation between the vastness of an area that is intervened in and the de degree of biodiversity and the acceleration by which the system is then moved. So the methods that have understand the process of intervention to, to, to effectively bioengineer an environment. So it becomes more biodiverse and more productive. But the scale is critical. You know, doing it in the back garden is brilliant, but it's not going to reap re re the systemic effect. And I think one of the, one of the challenges of the that I think are raising is what the system indicates. And how do they hurt you? And I'm not sure they do. I think what you have are two completely different things happening. So on one level, nature takes over on a massive scale to be able to then replenish itself without us being involved. On another level, we're playing a little bit of time. 
What else have we got over there? Okay. And I was unsure about what we were doing, so what <laughs> And it was we're serious. making it up as we go along. You should have guessed that by now. I'm making it up as we're going along as well. So what I offered was a framework uh, of indicators, if you like, based on a system view of an organisation. So, and that was really useful because it was very easy for us to very conveniently put all of these contributions into inputs, processes that are used to convert the inputs to outputs. Okay, so the inputs are typically the feed, feed and quantity and so on. The processes are the, are the effect, effectiveness and efficiency with which we convert the inputs to produce the outputs. And it talks about the wastes and the re, rejects and in reprocessing or the, the process of whatever we're talking about. And then the outputs are more, more to do with quality and some... Um, yeah, quality, I think, <laughs> seems to be the one that seems to summarise this category here. Is there any real distinction between these two? And then I was going to make the point that this is a framework that seems to apply almost in each of the categories. Yeah. So we, you know, and this is based on my understanding of how organisations work. We talk in, you know, the engineers would talk in terms of inputs that we need to process or that we that need processing to produce the outcomes that we want. The outputs and outcomes are kind of a little bit different. Really. Different outcomes. So you need to close the loop between outputs and outputs. Okay, now in, ter in terms of loops, and what we hope, hopefully will talk about in the convergence is that if we were to extend this view, we have to go through this process, and ultimately what we're doing is trying to trying to come up with happy customers. Now, I don't Sorry, know. Could you just repeat that, please? Okay, to extend this loop and to talk about it in terms of a loop, we would also add to this, we produce outputs and outcomes so that we get happy customers in a business situation. Happy customers are good for our bank balance and so on. So that's the purpose of why we're in business and that's probably moving beyond permaculture per se. But still, we need to take that into account. And then in terms of the loop, and what we're trying to achieve is to constantly improve. So what we do is we talk to the customers and say, this is our output, how do you feel about that output? Does it meet, meet your needs and expectations? Is it fit for your purpose? And then they're going to say, yeah, not quite. And then we look at, we look at our process and figure out at what point we didn't quite meet customers' expectations. So you've identified a loop of improvement through meeting the customer needs. Yeah. You identified a loop in terms of enhancing planetary health. Is that very different? I think so. Comments, please. <laughs> I think it is extremely different, almost dangerous <laughs> in, in the, but I, I see the, the analogy you're making the difficulty for me is if you ask an individual you know, do this please you well it might have pleased me but it might not please my neighbour across the road and um, that's fine that's saying are you happy with something but it's the value system that you we touched on it before behind that happens it can't be just my personal happiness it must be happiness with respect it's, it's a different concept of customer satisfaction. It's not individual centred, it's more perhaps community centred. Um, um, my, my view of that is that you, you check to see if the customer's happy, if they feel as though they got value for money. They had an expectation that they were going to buy something that met their purpose. If it doesn't meet their purpose, for whatever reason, quality, and so on. Well, then, because that purpose might not be my benefit. That's correct. Yeah. Can I just? Um, can I just? Well, well, hang on, hang on. <coughs> just, just in like this, this idea of kind of happy customer. I think when, when we're in this situation, there also has to be, and I guess this feeds into the cultural and spiritual side of things as well. Is that what happens if our customers aren't human? And our who, who, where does the where does the customer end? Are our customers also chickens? Are our customers 
because if we're putting ourselves in a position of this much power, there needs to also come with that the acceptance of the responsibility that also comes with that, which is we're taking control of all this system, so therefore we also have to bear in mind the impact of our actions on the other customers who may not, you know, work in this way. Other customers or stakeholders, perhaps. In yeah. this case, it's animal welfare. Yeah, just I just wanted to highlight some of the processes that people actually mentioned. So when they were talking about measurables, labour efficiency, um, the cost of maintenance and repair, um, and people did mention this, um, how important it is to close the system, like you say, but how you measure, you know, how you, people haven't talked too much about how you might do that. And then the outputs were food quality and yield, and um, the inputs were basically the costs of production. Give me. I'm conscious that time is moving up. I'll take a couple more, and then I want to go back to your point about more holistic indicators. Maybe it's an output of <coughs> doing stuff sustainable, but what about the succession of the people doing the knowledge which is maintained in the community of practitioners? That, that seems to me to be an output. No one knows how to do this. Where are people learning this? What methods are they using? That seems to have been lost in here. Like what is the actual knowledge output? So it's the, not, it's the sustainability of the knowledge yeah. and the systems in place to allow that. If there's one at the back there. Yeah, I just uh, I think we have to be quite careful with this sort of idea. Uh, I think it's sort of discussion to people's numbers because I think it's hard to find where we stuck and where. Our environment begins. I mean, uh, so I think that was the point that you were making, really, wasn't it? The, the, the state of our health depends on the state of our environment. So, I mean, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to think of this in terms of input and output. So, if we were to think of it in, in terms of input and output, the only sort of way I can imagine doing that was, you know, look at where do we actually have a closed system. We know by definition that the Earth is a closed system. It has to be a closed system. It's more or less closed. The only thing that goes in is energy, and the only thing that comes out is energy at the long way. And it is that, you know, that's the only place where we can make this input output analysis. So, as far as you're concerned, then the indicators only truly matter if they're actually somehow operational at the global level? They have to. And I think that the best measure we could actually come up with is you know, if you want to measure the health of the biological. How much does it recycle its energy when it comes into the first house? How many processes it is in the system? Now I want to move on. Katie, you were saying earlier on that we need some measures that could cross these boundaries. Well, I was just kind of trying to put it to the next level, maybe to integrate these indicators because I guess if you keep working in this kind of knowledge making that is um, dominant in research, you know, like it's kind of framed by the institutions, it's framed by disciplines, it's framed by where the money comes from, the funding, and then, yeah, I guess if, if the research game can be changed a little bit, you know, then I think it should be possible to, um, yeah, to kind of imagine research also very differently in terms of integrating things like not only in a quantifiable way, but maybe integrating different types of things that count as valid data. You know, I think that's, that was my point. Problem is that in much of our world, at least in India, there is a lot of focus on few crops. So customer is customer happiness is often illusory because their knowledge is not enough to include many kind of food. So if there is 30,000 food data, we 80% 80, 80 of that is coming from 30. So only in different brands. So the, there is a cast, casteist idea that there is a superior food and there is an inferior food. So all the poor people's food, which is collected from the forest, is considered as an inferior food. And that is why we have scarcity. 
this was not talked about this morning, but it is not just waste. It is also not recognizing many things as food, just because the one time we educate people to eat white bread instead of brown because it is good. And then we add a spoonful of bran and call it 45. <laughs> After removing 200, 300 bran. So this, what is customer happiness is very much doctor. By <laughs> 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 I want to pause there because we need to wrap up in a few minutes and we need to start talking about the next steps. So, just one last question. Okay, one last question from over here. Uh, uh, I mean, if the research aims at solving some solutions, I have, I mean, I have been trying to read our research on things that uh, on the lines, and I just find what is uh, now and what we want to do. But there's not much information or research done on the transition period. Well, that's the hard bit. <laughs> uh, so, I, mean, I mean, from my point of view, the strange thing about the, sustain the conventional, straight down the line, sustainable agriculture research paradigm is if we go back about 10 years ago, there was the concept flying around of what we call one planet farming. In other words, that's agriculture that somehow stays within the global limit. That virtually disappeared in terms of the discussions. And sustainable agriculture, if you look around now, is about reducing the environmental harm whilst increasing the productivity levels at some unspecified scale. And that might be at the field scale, that might be at the planetary scale. But the idea of the limits is only now starting to come back into the discussions again. And, and that also ties in with some of these other issues of diversity and resilience, which are now actually getting into the mainstream of commercial large-scale food chains. So, what, so I haven't heard anything in this discussion that I've not heard whilst talking to groups like uh, Unilever mm -hmm. or Kellogg's or whatever, which I think is really interesting. Okay. I just want to ask, you're talking about productivity. How do you measure the productivity? And should people talk about yield, and it's usually quantified yield? Do we not need different measures, like perhaps nutrition density as an, as an output picture? Yeah, that's another one that's starting to come through in the research agenda, that it's, that it's not enough just to generate X gigacalories that one needs uh, the diversity, the nutritional content. Yeah, and, and I think, again, the more the permaculture world can lock into these debates, then you can sort of start to mainstream some of the solutions that you're developing. Whether you want to do that is another question. That's one of the things you're saying, you know, what are the parameters of this narrative? And I would say that there are very, very clear things that, that people like Unity Paul Pullman and I had an interesting row publicly recently about consciousness, for example, and the extent to which Unilever, as one of the seven major companies on the planet, determines what human beings wish to purchase, <laughs> which in turn has a massive effect on all the things we're talking about. Now, consciousness, in terms of Unilever's concept, is utterly about our utility in relation to resource. What I was talking about was something completely different. It was about the consciousness of a forest. And they, are, they just don't want to engage in the conversation because they know they can't make money out of it. So I think that, that I would disagree that, 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 that there are things in this room that would necessarily not be things you talk about. I think there are fundamental differences in perspective which the permaculture world that I've always worked in have implicitly embedded in ethics and principle and practice which corporations simply do not adopt or apply. And they're trying to use it now to greenwash the, the consciousness of, the, of people who are willing to play with that. And there is a very, very big public argument to have with those organisations which says, look, you are mainly the, the reason why we are in this mess. And they won't engage in a public debate because they know it affects their shareholder value and all those other things. And it's, it's, it's easy to say, oh, we won't have that discussion. 
But interestingly, the United Nations want to have it, and the corporations are pushing away from it. The European Union have tried to have it, and the corporations push away. And the reason is because they are so powerfully influencing our day-to-day -day consuming approach to all of this type of thing. And that, I think, is exactly the point we made about the, the paradigm that we use to create the measures by which this works. And I think we fall very quickly, if we're not careful, into the old metrics. And that's not going to help this debate to move forward. We've got to look but for do we need, transform this. Debate. But do we need the old metrics plus? No. We need totally new ways of perceiving what this problem is. And that's what this type of agenda is. That's why I come to this event. Because I think the people in this community internationally have got some practiced examples of this, not just in their own daily lives, but that system level that could be taken forward, which would radically challenge this paradigm that we've got in the So in other words, I'm curious as to whether this whole approach is valid. <laughs> <laughs> and I would encourage people to come forward to this idea as a cultural project. We can talk with people. Because that, if we're going to avoid from that debate, we all have to be involved in it. The worst, well, I don't know, I feel that the worst thing that can happen is you end up with two separate sets of metrics that just don't speak to each other. Where are they? I think Governor Johnson part this morning put it very nicely. I mean, I'm sort of, I'm sort of getting a little bit older in years, and I remember when I first told you how you talk, I was 18 years old. I'm now 55, and I've seen a whole lot of things go round and round in circles, including things like measuring in biometrics. And I noticed early on in this conversation, I'm getting a, a little bit annoyed um, and recognizing that feeling. And I totally agree with what this, this gentleman said. And I think that when he said we need to look at that, John we need to look at that operational code that we're working on, that's, that's where we need to sort of step back here. You know, all the time it's been looking downstream instead of looking upstream. Industry. So not looking at not looking at sort of um, um, an example of um, looking at um, Graham's farm. His his upstream desire was to was for profitability in a sustainable way. That's I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm making myself clear because it's it's complicated stuff. But but it's it's that need to look up there rather than downstream. Look at the operational code um, where we need to be. Speaking as a, as a research scientist, I think I, I appreciate what you're saying. There was a time in Scotland where the Scottish Government, or well then the Scottish Office, received a block grant from Westminster. It was given to the researchers, as it probably was done in institutes in England, and we were 100% funded. And that was guaranteed by law. And we were independent. I could choose what I wanted to do, so I could talk to you, and I could choose. At the moment, only about half of that money comes now from government. And I have to pander to the <laughs> stakeholders. Which means, if I want to do a full life cycle analysis, it's very difficult to do. For the reasons you said as well, about the framing, but also because of the corporate interests. So I, for me as a researcher, I'm, I'm concerned as to the extent which I can really get to the roots of a problem because I'm under pressure to pull in X hundred thousand, and it is hundreds of thousands of pounds a year. Where's that money coming from? It's not coming from the government. <laughs> 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 That's to find some, some common language because as a researcher, when you say, well, I want to look at, measure things in different ways, my first reaction is, how? How do you measure that? You know, I want to, I'm used to doing things measuring things. So such an important conversation, how we can, you know, you say there are measures, it'd be good to get all that in one place and review those different approaches. Yeah, um, I think that um, permaculture has a principle built into it of adaptive management or participatory action research, which is like this observe and, and reflect and implement the results of your observations. But that doesn't feed back into what, that's on a farm scale or a property scale, a paddock scale, doesn't feed back into permaculture's overall knowledge. So part of the problem is that properly myths get propagated, or claims that don't, aren't substantiated get pro propagated through the system and keep getting taught in permaculture design courses. And we don't have a mechanism for publication and peer review, and it's not accessible to practitioners. I'm just trying to publish my first paper. That's taken me a year and 30 editions. It's no way, if you're not funded as a researcher, that you're going to do that. 
So, I mean, that may be um, culture needs its own publications and its own peer review process to get some of this knowledge substantiated and out there. And the other thing is that um, the scale issue is that because we operate at this property scale, we're trying to be sustainable at that scale, but we don't really consider whether if you scale that up to the whole world, whether the whole world could do it. Because we just start off with an area of land and then design for that area of land without considering that footprint and, and whether we've got that carry capacity on the planet for 10 billion people. There's one possible area that hasn't really been discussed yet, which is natural capital. And although it can be contentious because at the moment it's about the value of everything, if we look at it the other way around, it's what is everything of value. And if you're looking at it from a corporate perspective, it's a completely different version to a global perspective or a care perspective. The, the idea of natural capital has a great deal in it in terms of being able to look at the academic So I'm going to come in here. I think one of the things that I, I want to get from this, and not right now, because it's not something I can have right now, but in the long term is, is working, I feel like I'm a practitioner and an academic researcher, and there's so much interesting knowledge held by Graham, by, um, by each of you, by Beck, by all of you who are doing things. Where are the similarities and differences in, in your results? And is there a method, a new method, by which we can capture that? Because traditional ecological research, we just go, well, it's not a standardized replication. We can't deal with that. But is there a way of dealing with that, of getting some results? And how do we work, how do we work together to share our validate and use this knowledge? And I think a big part of what the Permaculture International Research Network is trying to do is address some of these issues and bring us together to answer some of these questions. Um, just to say sorry for anybody who is able to stay until Thursday morning, but then having that informal meeting in this location, and it's not my meeting, and I don't know if I can invite you all, but I kind of want to anyway. <laughs> so if you're here on Thursday morning, uh, it's 9 to 12, somewhere in this building, um, come along, we'll, we'll welcome you and make room for you. We can see maybe how we can take some. Permaculture International Research Network that Chris launched this morning um, and it's just about bringing together people who are interested in research, practitioners, academics, people who think they'd like to use the, the knowledge to understand how we can better build the credible evidence base for permaculture, to understand what works where in what sort of situations, when can we apply it, and address some of these things that are perhaps their myths that they were, and we just do them, and perhaps they're not. So it's ambitious, but it's not this room. I don't know exactly which room it is, but I think if we go to reception, I'll make sure that some notes are there. If you see Chris, you can always Chris Warburton Brown. Yeah, Chris Warburton Brown, who was on, on stage this morning, would definitely have some class I'm aware that we've, we've kind of out of time, so I'm going to May I just ask why did you not and it's a bit challenging to do on my way to this workshop, but why did you not start this step question? Because I felt by like getting to the kind of mainstream categories we all know, my categories didn't necessarily fit into there, so I had to put them in there and then if you have thirty or ten posts, so the notions that are not yet captured by the mainstream are falling apart because of the way we categorize it. So how come at the permaculture conference we start the way around and try to open it up rather than to categorize it according to the current funding mainstream scientific approach. And we also have at the beginning that um, the evidence is not there because it's all small scale, random, at all, etc. Now we know that, but I mean, there is lots of it. And the anecdotal can be connected to come from the else. So it's just a bit of a question to the way <laughs> the permaculture movement or etc. Uh, wants to also. Organize itself to try to make the case that's more strongly or quicker than having to go through the mainstream process to kind of find. Yeah. And, and I think it is a big challenge trying to lift these two things up. I feel like I always sit in the middle of things, but I feel like 
yeah, this is this is a big challenge that we want to address, and that is not something that we can achieve in two hours, but it's definitely a starting this is just the starting point of the story mm -hmm. we're really nicely going forward in. We're bringing in these things that's incredibly useful. So well, yeah. also at the beginning we were asked you know, to think of three things yes. that you could say so to you somebody, you know, if they ask the question, well what do you prefer what you can bring in the how do you compare it with other forms of food production, what would be the three things you'd measure? I think that's quite valid because you know I have a lot we have a lot of different growers in the area I'm in. And they're always asking, you know, well, you know, what is this permaculture? Well, well, show me what you So I was sort of immediately on the tracks of input, outsource, quality. And we have to think like that because we actually do operate in the real world. And that's what other people are always asking us. What, what is this about? How can you win anybody over to your way of thinking if you can't give them that information? So we have to have something measurable. I think we have something Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, just one last point and then it's what's done. I think the, the, the exciting thing, I mean, it's, it's all about positives and things like that. And one of the reasons why we're all here is, um, you know, the evolution that's happening using things like technology, crowdsourcing, um, uh, you know, organic, organic development that, uh, you know, that's happening through technology that's brought us together to help us share knowledge and, and so forth. And I think that will automatically break down um, the boundaries that you mentioned, like, you know, that's been forced, the standardized systems that have been forced down by us by corporate interests and things like that. You know, we are starting to decide what it is that we want, how we want to define things, how we want to, you know, evolve and develop things, what it is that we want to apply. So it's happening, whether we like it or not, it's an organic evolution. And, no, I mean, could, could I have to do a quick ad? Um, we, we, we do finally have a university in the world that's standing up and actually saying we are going to offer uh, permaculture at the postgraduate level. So if we want research to be done, there is now a university that's well recognised and that will give you your graduate diploma, your masters. And so if you want to chase this scientific base of permaculture, at least now there, there is an institution that will be behind it um, such that your piece of paper is um, recognised worldwide. That's University of Central Queensland, which is, we will have a display downstairs. And um, yeah, I'm working with them and I, I think it's pretty important. On that note, we maybe just have a really quick show of hands. I really hope we should have done this at the beginning, so I apologise. Um, hands up if you consider yourself to be a natural Do you, do you have everybody's names that want to be? If, if you want to be involved in some way in the Perth, please just make sure we've got your name and, and email address. We'll speak to one of us. Thank you so much for your time with the British Ecological Thank you.